to this third Sunday in Advent. Um, just a couple things, just a reminder that we have the annual meeting after church today. I know that um, all of our voting materials and everything were passed out before services. Um, and thank you to the people that have allowed their names to be on the ballot. The only position that's still open is the position of two, oh, two positions, vice president and treasurer. So if, when the time comes, nominating, if you're interested, if the spirit is talking to you, don't be afraid to raise your hand. Um, the council meeting this week will be on Thursday at 7 p.m. And just um, our, all of our new council members are going to be invited to that meeting um, as a transition. And then the final thing I have is that Pastor Cindy will be on vacation this week. Um, Pastor Cindy, is there somebody specific that will be covering? Is it Pastor Donkey will cover any emergency situations. And that is all I have. Please um, prepare your hearts and minds for worship. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget. 
forget that we are your children and turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one, and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Christ Jesus has looked with favor upon you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. You are children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise, and recipients of divine mercy. God strengthens you anew to follow the way of peace. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Thank you. We're now going to sing. Sorry, I was just going to say. <laughs> We're singing.
preaching of John, that rejoicing in your salvation, we may bring forth the fruits of repentance through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we will hear reading from Scripture. Good morning. Good morning. First reading for today is taken from the third chapter of the book of Zephaniah, verses 14 through 20. The prophet Zephaniah's message is mostly one of judgment for sin. This reading, however, which comes from the conclusion of the book, prophesies joy for Judah and Jerusalem. Judgment has led to repentance, and God's salvation is at hand. And now the reading. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You, you shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. As on a day of festival, I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. All that time I will bring you home at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please read responsibly from, um, this is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 2 through, two through 6. In the midst is the Holy One of Israel, I'm sorry, in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known the deeds of the Lord among the nations, proclaim that this name is exalted. Sing, Sing praises of the Lord, Lord, for he is ungraciously. Let us be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O loyal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Today's second reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Despite being in prison, Paul is remarkably upbeat as he writes this letter. Here he urges his friends in Philippi to trust God with all their worries and concerns with the hope that they will experience God's joy and peace. And now reading. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And we have the gospel acclamation. And let us stand as we are able for the gospel. Alleluia. I am sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. John the Baptist heralds the mighty one who is coming. John teaches that preparation for God's reign is not a matter of identity, but of bearing fruits of merciful justice. Radical generosity and vocational integrity. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits worthy of repentance.
repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the clouds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? He said to them, Do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And you may be seated. So here we are on the third Sunday of Advent, and we've been talking, I'm assuming, all of you here, and myself and other places I am, we are talking about this being the season, the season of hope, the season of peace, the season of joy, and soon, uh-oh, guess what? We need to do our candles, don't we? Didn't I repeat what what uh, Pastor Dunkey did last week? But I caught myself. I caught myself because as I looked at that pink candle, I thought, wait a minute, it's not lit. So this, we are going to light these candles before I go on to talk to you about John the Baptist. But what I do want to share is this week we light the beautiful pink candle. For some reason, it's my favorite. And it is the week of joy. So let us follow in our bulletin on page 10. Third Sunday of Advent, we're going to light this candle. We praise you, O oh God, for this victory wreath that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, strengthen our hearts as we await the Lord's coming in glory. Enlighten us with your grace, that we may serve our neighbors in need. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain, and whose day draws near. Amen. <laughs>
how beautiful Advent candles are lit. Only one more week. Next week, the fourth candle will be lit. Alrighty, so here we are in the Gospel of Luke. This is year C. And we are in the Gospel of Luke. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Luke. He was a physician and a Gentile Christian. And he writes to the whole world. And so when we heard those words in the Gospel today, if they are for the whole world, that means they are for us. This was probably written about 60 A.D., and he has a complete story of Jesus' life. He begins with, with the, the Annunciation where the angel comes to Mary. And, and he, in his story, has the birth of Jesus. He, in his story, tells us about Jesus as a child. He, in his story, moves on and on and on. And in the end, not only does he teach us about how our beloved Savior went to the cross for us. And of course, he teaches us about his resurrection. And he teaches us then, in that second book he wrote, the book of Acts, he teaches us about his ascension into heaven. And he teaches us the story of early Christianity. He teaches us about Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and beyond. But the beautiful thing in the Gospel of Luke is he too was a Gentile and he is one of the Gospel writers who lets us know that Jesus came for everyone. So John the Baptist, that fiery preacher, you know, there's this gentle Christmas song and I am not going to sing it to you because I did try it the other day and I just couldn't do it real good. But it's by Kathy Matea. And uh, it is from a song called A Wonderful Beginning. And here's what she sings in the first verse. Oh, a man named John the Baptist had been heralding the news about the coming of a Savior for both the Gentiles and the Jews. I love that song. It opens with that verse and it ends with that verse. And it tells us how we are waiting for, in the season of Advent, waiting for Emmanuel, who is God with us. And today we heard the story, one of the stories about John the Baptist. There's numerous ones in the Bible. You may have even heard a little bit about him last week. He is the one preparing the way for Jesus. And I think if we ran into him, we might find him to be just a little bit scary, wearing his scratchy camel hair clothing. And if he invited us to lunch, we might have to sit with him and eat the locusts and the honey. I think that would be a little intimidating to me. But he is the launching pad for Jesus. And if you look at Christian art, John the Baptist is always pointing to Jesus. It was last year that I heard that, and so I went on a website, and I looked up John the Baptist, and I think you would have fun doing that too. See how many paintings he is pointing to Jesus. So he is pointing the way that Jesus is coming, and Jesus is the good news. That's what actually the end of today's lesson said. He proclaimed the good news to the people, which is the good news of Jesus. But he is that fiery preacher. He is that preacher who kind of preaches loud and angry, and he tries to get people's attention. I just have to ask, in days past, did any of you have fiery preachers like fire and brimstone like John the Baptist in this place? Anybody? Was there any preacher who could just preach to you and, and maybe the fear of God came over your body and your soul? Because I have heard at other churches that there were pastors 
to preach like that before the year 2000. We might be going back into the 50s and the 60s, maybe even the 70s. But today, when you heard John the Baptist preach, I don't know about you, but your ears are open. You are paying attention. So that fire and brimstone preaching does do something. All right, so what about this John the Baptist guy? Is he for real? Do you think he's for real? Yes, the Bible says so. But guess what? This apocalyptic preacher who preached and lived in the wilderness, there is a Jewish and Roman historian named Josephus, and people have read his word, and let me tell you what his word says that I'm going to share with you today. Listen to this. To some of the Jews, the destruction of Herod's army seemed to be divine vengeance, and certainly a just vengeance for his treatment of John, surnamed the Baptist. For Herod had put him to death, Though he was a good man and had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice toward their fellows, and piety toward God, and so doing to join in baptism. So Josephus was a first century historian and in his writings, which often people will compare the writings of Josephus on next to the Bible, and the people and the dates are very close. So he talks about John the Baptist. He gave valuable insight to the first century of what was going on in that time, and he gave some really good history about early Christianity. He also talked about Pontius Pilate and Herod the Great and James the Just. And of course, we just learned today that he spoke of John the Baptist. So here is John the Baptist out in the wilderness. And the people are listening to his angry, harsh voice. And what do they say? What should we do? What should we do? And, and as we listen to his voice today, do we think, what should we do? Because we do believe he is talking with us too. You know, he, who does he talk to? He talks to tax collectors, and he wants them to only collect what they should collect so that people aren't oppressed. Uh, he wants the military people to do what they're supposed to do. He wants to break the cycle of the things that were going on in those days that were not good to people. He is calling for people to change. He's calling for them to repent and to turn toward God. And changing is a way that he says we can do this. So do you think today we can call out to each other after hearing this message from John the Baptist, can we call out also what are we to do? What can we do today that if John the Baptist came among us, he would be pleased. He would be pleased. You know, he really did just give us basic, practical advice. He wants us to participate in practical and good things. So if we're a teacher, I might have a teacher in the house, we are to be with our students and teach well. And I think also, as I have been with teachers, I have found that some of the best teachers have something that they need and we all need. They have patience. How many of us here, we don't even have to be a teacher, but we have children, or we have grandchildren, or we have great-grandchildren, or we have great pieces. I babysit for great pieces. And, and, and what I have learned with all the little children that I am with, I need to have patience. Patience. We all need patience. And guess what? I'm usually with two or three kids at a time. Teachers are sometimes with 30 kids. Can you imagine the patience they need? What about being a coach? They need to be encouraging, and they need to be uplifting, and they need to be positive, and they also need to be teaching the team the things that they think the team needs to 
learn to win that game. How about a counselor? Anybody here ever seen a counselor? You know what? They need to be professional and they need to be caring and they need to be a good listener. What if you're just a basic, ordinary, married person? What might the practical advice that we could give you? Oh, but I'd love to hear. I often, when a couple says, I've been married 70 years, or next week is my 67th anniversary, I always say, what is your secret? Married folks, what would be the practical advice that you would give to a, a newly married couple? I have the blessing, actually, of being in Florida next week and officiating my nephew's wedding. I would love for you to write down a piece of paper, every one of you, I wish you could, and put it in the offering basket. Write down the advice that you would give to a newly married couple. I wrote down be honest and true. I think those are two things that are important. To be a church leader, we, we, maybe we need to be prayerful, uh, share the faith in Jesus where we can, have Christian behaviors when we go out and about. How about these choir folks? I got to hear the bell choir folks this morning playing beautiful music. Be prepared on Christmas Eve at this place, 7.30 p.m. on Christmas Eve. You will hear some beautiful music from the bell choir. What about farmers? You know, I've always made it my rule when I'm in a church, especially this one that I've heard is called the Cathedral in the Cornfield. That's what I've heard you all be called, and it was some of your own folks who said it. What could farmers' practical advice be for people? I just read a wonderful book called Centered. And it's by Jason Brown. I just finished it this morning. I listened to it on Audible. I had three more minutes left. He was an NFL football player for a number of years who felt that God was calling him to be a farmer. He left his career. He went, I think it's to North Carolina, First Fruits Farm, and he gives everything away. Now, we can't all do that, but he does have some resources and a wife who I think is a dentist who, who does still work some, but he farms and gives everything away. And as a farmer, he grows these crops and he gleans and he has volunteers, like thousands of volunteers that come and they share sweet potatoes and cucumbers. And so a farmer, what would be practical advice that a farmer could give to a new farmer, especially one who wants to share with others. You know, I could go on and on and on. We just know that John the Baptist, he preached social justice. He preached caring for others. He preached that people need sufficient clothing because he talks about giving away a coat. I tell you, every time I read this passage, I want to go to my closet and give some coats away. Absolutely. And he talks about sharing food. And I know that you all share food with local food pantries, so you're doing these things. And I just think if John the Baptist was among us, he'd be glad to hear that. All right, then he also talks about Jesus and Jesus' baptism. And we know that John the Baptist gave a different kind of baptism. Yes, they both use water, but... but John the Baptist was trying to get people to repent and to cleanse themselves and, and to turn toward God. And we, when we are baptized, which baptism is just one of my favorite church holy moments, we bring in the baptism font out. And whatever age that person is, we do as Jesus told us in the Great Commission. We baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son in the name of the Holy Spirit, and people everywhere are smiling. I don't know if people are smiling here with the John the Baptist baptism, but we who are baptized, we receive the cross of Christ on our forehead, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we become a child of God forever. Those things are the 
good news. So sometimes you have to think a little bit past the lesson. We are waiting for Jesus, the Christ child, to come. We are waiting, we are anticipating, we are waiting for him because he is the good news to the people. He is coming soon. And you already know, because we're on the other side of the cross, he is already here among us now. And when we come forward to Holy Communion, we know that he accepts us as we are. We might not always be able to do more or to change a job or to change a, a way of life. There could be a reason we cannot. You know what I had a young lady say one time in a retreat? I'm not doing anything but taking care of my son and all of you are doing so much more. And one of the ladies in the room said, that's what God's calling you to do at this moment. So yes, we can add some practical good things to our life to help others, but sometimes we, at this moment, might only be doing exactly what we can do, and maybe that's what God is calling you to do at this moment. Always remember, for God, you are enough. God loves you just as you are every day, no more, no less, no matter what you do. But I do like in this particular lesson that John, even though he's rough and gruff and eating those locusts and honey and wearing some scratchy clothing, he's asking people to do some pretty practical things. He's asking them to help others. I want to end today with a little devotion from one of my favorite folks, and his name is Henry Nowen. He has written so many books, and he was such a faithful priest and such a faithful man, a beautiful person. And I want to read this meditation to you that is a December meditation, and it is called The Christ Child Within. So here are these words from Henry Nowen. I think that we have hardly thought through the immense implications of the mystery of the Incarnation. Where is God? God is where we are weak, vulnerable, small, and dependent. God is where the poor are, the hungry, the handicapped, the mentally ill, the elderly, the powerless. How can we come to know God when our focus is on elsewhere, possibly on success or influence or power? I increasingly believe that our faithfulness will depend on our willingness to go where there is brokenness, loneliness, and human need. Each one of us is very seriously searching to live and grow in this belief. And by friendship, we can support each other. I realize that the only way for us to stay well in the midst of the many worlds is to stay close to the small and vulnerable child that lives in our hearts and in every other human being. Often, when we do not know that the Christ child is in us, when we discover him, we can truly rejoice. And that is what today is. This is the third Sunday of Advent. And this is the Sunday that we focus on joy and we focus on rejoicing. Remember the good news. And in the reading from Philippians, Paul tells us, rejoice. The Lord is near. And then he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
reading and watching, we offer the gifts of our hearts and our lives to the service of all your people. Prepare the way before us as we meet you in this simple meal. Through Christ Jesus, our pathway and our peace. Amen. Amen. We continue with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of all Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all who is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnated by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified not in his heaven. He suffered death and was buried. For the third day he rose again, and in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. Holy God, renew your church and raise up leaders who announce your good news. Grant peace to congregations and seminarians in the midst of transition. Guide the work of candidacy and call committees. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Creating God, your spirit brought forth the earth and all that is in it. Breathe life into us that we are inspired to live in harmony with one another and the planet. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Shepherd in God, you lead your people in paths of righteousness. Raise up prophets in your own day who warn against captivity to greed and point us to the freedom found in generosity. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nurturing God, you come near in times of worry and need. Cradle us in your arms that we trust you and are not afraid. Attend to any who are hungry, imprisoned or ill this day. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, we pray for all those affected by the hurt, the tornadoes the last couple of days. We pray for those who lost loved ones, who lost their homes, who lost their businesses. We pray for those first responders that will be working in the next days months and years to rebuild. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Rejoice in God. You exalt over us in singing. Enliven the song of this assembly and bless the ministry of church musicians. With instruments and dance, join our voices to the song of all creation. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We give you thanks for your servants who showed us your goodness and grace. By the power of your spirit, keep us steadfast in faith until we make our home with you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Spirit and the Church cry out, Amen. Amen. Come, Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus. All those who await His appearance pray, 
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The whole creation pleads. Amen. Amen. Come, Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
to the world, let us pray. Into your wide embrace, O oh God, we place all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting that you will receive them into your heart of mercy. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We receive the blessing. The God of hope fills us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen. And I think for this last hymn, we should stand. And I also think we should remember that after this last hymn, I may dismiss you, but we do have our annual congregation meeting. And we do hope that everyone will be able to stay and participate. Mm -hmm.